Okay, so this is a presentation I made for a class in grad school, an earth science class. I did a ton of research on geoengineering, found a bunch of really scary stuff, so I wanted to share my presentation. Um, context is climate change, which of course is the conflict between thermostatic equilibrium, um, which is the temperature balance of the earth, and industrial capitalism, which is an economic system that's predicated on perpetual growth and um, constantly increasing consumption of natural resources. So why are these two things in conflict? Um, the thermostatic equilibrium, so basically the Earth is a natural thermostat for about the last 10,000 years. It's been in this relatively stable state temperature-wise. And obviously, of course, over the like long term of the Earth's existence, there have been huge temperature shifts and like ice ages and things like that. But that's on a really long scale. And for the last 10,000 years, about 8,000 BC until 1950, um, the temperature averaged over 50 years only ranged um, within about a 1 degree Celsius or 2 degrees Fahrenheit band. How did that happen? Well, that's because of net zero radiation balance. Um, that means like the amount of solar radiation coming in from the sun is equal to the amount of heat leaving the earth because the earth is a hot rock in a cold place. It's also radiating heat. These two things um, are both influenced by the amount of clouds and the amount of water vapor in the sky and just all kinds of um, just variables having to do with the state of the earth. Um, and for 10,000 years, these variables were all sort of balanced very carefully in what was called the Holocene Epoch, and that's why the temperature stayed the same for so long. So then we have capitalism, and of course there are a lot of ways to define capitalism. This is just from a very like physics and chemistry perspective, like what does capitalism do to the physical makeup of the earth? Um, and basically there are two main um, physical effects that are relevant for this presentation. So there's uh, combustion, which is an oxidation reaction, and that means you take a complex organic molecule um, made up with like tons of different like carbons and sulfurs and nitrogen and oxygen, all that stuff, and you burn it, you break it up, you and all the bond energy is released, um, and that energy can be used for human industrial processes. But what you leave behind is all this particulate matter, so like carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and these sort of little molecule pieces um, instead of these more complex organic materials. And the other thing is um, the uh, deforestation of the planet. So the opposite of oxidation reactions, the reduction reaction like photosynthesis, where you do the exact opposite. You just take a bunch of particulate matter like that and like carbon dioxide and you use the solar energy in, and then in chlorophyll you build these uh, organic materials. That's sort of where they come from in the first place. And of course um, the amount of tree cover, forest cover, plant cover in general on the earth has been decreasing pretty rapidly. This is just a little um, quick view of that in one place in the Amazon, pretty rapidly being deforested, mostly for cattle ranching. Um, so anyway, there's a lot more combustion, a lot less photosynthesis, and on net what that means is we get about 11 billion more tons of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere every year than the year before, and that number 11 is actually increasing, so we're sort of moving uh, in the wrong direction at an increasing speed. Um, what does that do? Well, of course, that is going to upset the thermostatic equilibrium. So after 1950, there's been this huge uptick in the um, carbon dioxide levels on the earth, in the Earth, which also then creates, um, because that increases sort of the blanketing of the heat leaving the Earth, that increases the average temperature of the Earth. Um, so this is actually, this graph is pretty old, and it's we're way, way higher, like sort of out in this crazy range up here now. Um, it's actually been two years since then, so I don't know where we are now since I made this presentation, but sort of the analogy that I want to make is that this uh, process of industrial capitalism where we're burning um, the Earth's fuel, sort of the analogy you can make is to something that unplugs its own power source as it moves too far, um, and that's sort of the state that we're at. So that's where geoengineering comes in, right? So people are talking about geoengineering as this possible solution. A bunch of people are talking about it as like, here's how we can solve climate change without really changing the way that society operates. And um, when people talk about geoengineering in general, like the thing that Bill Gates is investing in all that stuff, they're talking about stratospheric aerosol injection. So the idea is to inject um, aerosols, specifically sulfur dioxide, hydrosulfuric acid, is that right? No, sulfuric acid, um, whatever, basically sulfate particles, move these little particulate matters into the stratosphere. And what will happen, in theory, is that the um, particles will absorb and reflect the heat of the sun without letting it get down to the troposphere, which is where weather is. Um, and so that'll sort of maintain the temperature balance of the Earth 
Um, so instead of re reversing carbon dioxide back down to the regular state, the idea is we can now put more sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere to sort of try to make a new um, human equilibrium. And this is sort of NASA's reporting on it. Actually, uh, this is as of 2017. They're basically speaking as if this is just a future tense thing, right? So the effect of the aerosols, however, will be the opposite to the effect of the increasing atmospheric trace gases like CO2 cooling instead of warming the atmosphere. Um, before that update, the most recent version I have on the NASA website said they don't know what the results of stratospheric aerosol injection will be. So what does the academic record show, right? So there's one paper that actually tries to use a climate model, a world climate model, one of the best that we have to estimate what the effects of this would be. And so basically they tried to do the best case scenario, which is we're going to try to stabilize temperature and precipitation at the same time. And basically what they found is that that's not possible. They did um, like a couple hundred, I think, different uh, simulations, different runs of this simulation at different levels. And if you manage to stabilize the temperature on average across the earth, you create a massive precipitation decrease. Um, the reason for that has to do with where you're placing the aerosols. So basically, um, the reason you have precipitation in general is because there's lots of convection. There's a, a heat to cold differential as you move up um, further into the atmosphere. And so that means that heat, hot air rises, it cools, it comes back down, you have this sort of lapse rate. Um, and if you if you warm the stratosphere and cool the troposphere, which is what they're proposing to do, that decreases the lapse rate, then you have lower precipitation, you have less moisture rising up in the air, so you have less moisture that needs to come back down in the form of rain. Um, so their conclusion here is, it is physically not feasible to stabilize global precipitation and temperature simultaneously. And you actually see as time goes forward and CO2 increases, there's way, way more of a problem where precipitation just decreases completely dramatically, like an insane amount. Um, and that's also not the only, that, that's the one paper that looks specifically at um, this proposal. But we also know sulfur dioxide is currently being regulated by the EPA and by most world governments because it is the primary cause of acid rain. So increasing the amount of, if we we're like now intentionally injecting sulfur into the sky, that creates more acid rain. That's a very known impact of uh, SO2. That's why we currently don't emit it. Um, acid rain, of course, just uh, decreases the pH of rainwater, and that uh, is devastating to crops and just life in general because life needs water, and water uh, the water needs to be at a particular pH range, acidity range. Um, also, of course, the acid water going into the ocean, uh, it doesn't spread evenly across the whole ocean. If you've ever been in uh, water, you know that it travels in patches of cold and hot, and also it travels in patches of more acidic, less acidic. So when these big acidic um, areas of water, volumes of water just pass through different areas like um, coral reefs, it has the effect of really destroying a ton of the biodiversity. So that's why we see coral bleaching. Um, and like the Great Barrier Reef now, I think is like 90% bleached last era, which means it's actually more than that now. Um, also, ozone layer depletion. So uh, volcanoes are known to emit sulfur dioxide and a lot of these particles, and they reduce the temperature of these surrounding areas for a while, which is actually where this idea came from in the first place. But they also deplete the ozone layer, which uh, creates more like harmful UV radiation. There's just all kinds of um, harmful effects of volcanoes in particular. So if that's like the good case scenario, then that seems like a little worrisome. We also, there's been no re research on what the effects of this would be on o ocean circulation, wind patterns. Um, like thermohaline circulation, what the salinity levels would be. Like the research on this is really, really, really uh, scant, and what research there is seems to be pretty dramatically awful, as far as I can tell. But also, the most important thing is everything I've said so far is about global averages, and that's nothing to say about regional variations. So, of course, what is the optimal amount of SO2 to emit into the sky if we're doing this in the first place? Well, that depends where you are and whose temperature you're trying to stabilize. So, what is stable for high latitudes? Uh, is, is very unstable for the equatorial latitudes um, and vice versa. So basically, um, the level of uh, emissions that would be necessary to stabilize the temperature in, for example, the United States, China, and Europe um, would be really devastating. And here's the, the cutout pull quote that I think is very important here. Both tropical and Arctic SO2 injection would disrupt the Asian and African summer monsoons, reducing precipitation to the food supply for billions of people. So basically this proposal is saying we're going to reduce the viability of crops in the food supply for billions of people. Um, so I don't know how this is really even being talked about seriously by anyone as a consideration for something that could possibly happen. It seems pretty obviously to be um, an atrocious idea and I'm 
open to changing my mind on that if someone can point me to evidence that suggests this is wrong, but it really just seems like this is not the way to go. So how could this possibly ever happen? Well, this is what I'm going to call the laissez-faire scenario. So basically the scenario to think about is what if uh, collective action on climate change never actually materializes? Because of course I've been hearing about collective action on climate change my actual entire life, and so far literally nothing has happened. Like a couple people have come together to say a few things, but really nothing has happened, and it's gotten a lot. The problem's gotten a lot worse. Um, so what could happen is basically no one ever does anything about it and then companies just start, this is the private emission scenario, this is companies start emitting sulfur dioxide into the sky uh, for reasons of personal profit. Um, if that sounds a little ridiculous, well, um, we do know now that Exxon actually did research into carbon dioxide emissions uh, in the 90s and found that they were warming the planet but concluded that they should keep doing this because, quote, global warming can only help lower exploration and development costs in the Beaufort Sea, which is in the Arctic. Um, so basically they made an executive decision to continue uh, emitting carbon in order to warm the earth so that they can drill for more oil in the Arctic. And they were rewarded for that because now the Arctic drilling season has expanded from two months to five months since 1991. So that's scenario one is private emissions. The other possibility is regulatory capture, which would be that um, basically wealthy interests just pressure uh, national governments to do this for them, possibly by contracting out the uh, emissions to the private companies anyway. So it would be basically the same scenario. In either, either case, the scenario is we continue to emit CO2, and now we also start emitting SO2 in order to stabilize temperature, specifically in wealthy areas. Um, the problem with that is that wealthy areas are predominantly in the global north. Um, I think the standard world map really sort of understates this effect. If you look over at the globe on the right, um, the vast majority of the wealth of the earth is above that green line. Um, the reason for this is, of course, uh, colonialism, which is basically a net wealth flux from lower latitudes to higher latitudes. Um, so in other words, the way that we would optimize, quote unquote, the amount of SO2 emissions would be really devastating to the equatorial regions. And of course, also, it would not change any of the major problems with climate change, such as sea level rise, decreasing biodiversity, uh, ocean acidification, all kinds of things like that. But if we're just talking about human impact, basically, we can expect that the sea level will continue to rise at about the rate that it has been rising. Um, I think that there's sort of a misconception about sea level rise. It's not like the water literally just like creeps up at like millimeter meters per year. Um, water is always rising and falling with the tides, and basically if the average sea level across the entire globe is rising, that just means floods happen more often. So it used to be a place that floods every hundred years, maybe now floods every five years, or multiple times per year. Um, and if you're thinking that like maybe at that point is when the government would step in and try to sort of solve this problem, I don't think really think that's true because what has happened in, in the past when things actually have flooded, um, even in the richest country on earth, um, when people, the people who are being affected are poor people and people of color, generally speaking, the government doesn't really do anything. Um, and that's in the richest country on earth. Again, the places that are going to be affected are the places near the equator. So I just picked um, the biggest city sort of near the equator, which is Lagos. Um, the population of Lagos is actually gigantic. This number to, uh, from 2012 is twice as big as New York. But um, the number was like 6 million in 2006, and this is the most recent number that I could find sort of reliable data for. But who knows how many people live here right now. But basically, you look at this flood map, and pretty much everything is within uh, 5 meters at the very most of the flood line. So sort of as the um, waters rise, they're getting more on floods. And actually, I just Googled Lagos floods when I was researching this, and this was in 2018, or I guess early 2019. Um, and yeah, there are sort of floods constantly happening. Um, so what is the real impact of this scenario? Well, there's human habitat reduction, less livable area, um, wild temperature and precipitation fluctuations, and inevitably that's going to mean mass migration and resource wars as lakes dry up and as resources deplete and as there's more people sort of fighting for the same land. That does not look Good. Okay, so what's the other option, right? The other option is we go back to thermostatic equilibrium. We stop emitting carbon dioxide into the sky and we remove the carbon dioxide that we've already emitted into the sky um, and put it back into the earth using plants. Um, so this is basically just sort of a very basic point. An object in motion remains in motion unless a force is placed upon it. Um, this thing isn't going to stop by itself 
Um, and this is why when people ask sort of what is the best thing you can do to combat climate change, I mean, there's all kinds of things we can talk about in terms of carbon drawdown. And there really is, all this information is out there. There's this wonderful book, Drawdown. Um, there are a lot of plans. There are a lot of ways. We have all the technology ready to go. We know how to use solar energy instead of fuel. We know how to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the sky. All this technology is um, sort of been around for a very long time. Um, so the problem isn't really like people are making bad decisions in their personal life, like, you know, using too much air conditioning or heating their water too much or anything like that. I mean, obviously, whatever you can do in your personal life is great. But really, the thing is, um, this the societal structure we live under is really not um, calibrated to exist for a very long amount of time. It's sort of this just perpetual um, push towards uh, an unstable and pro progressively more unstable climate state. Um, and so I really think the most you can do as a as an individual person in um, your daily life is just normalize the end of industrial capitalism as sort of an inevitability. Um, just talk about it as if this is like a, a temporary state of affairs because it is. It's only existed for a couple hundred years and in that time it's already destroyed the planet that we live on. Um, I really think there's no other way around this. Again, I would love to um, keep all the luxuries of my lifestyle, but I just am not seeing a way that this can exist for very long. Um, yeah, so that's basically the situation. Um, my sources are all available online. If you don't know how to get ungated articles, um, you can use Sci-Hub. But yeah.